If you have a Bible with you, you could turn it to the Gospel of Matthew, first book in the New Testament, and we're going to be having a reading from Matthew and chapter 8, commencing at verse 5. I have a, a few readings, but this is the, the main reading, and we're going to commence Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion asked, answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under, I am but I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come. And he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard that, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. If you could go forward to Matthew in chapter 27. I'm going to read verse 54 in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 54. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And then finally, in Acts in chapter 10, It's further on, the fifth book of the New Testament, Acts chapter 10, just a few verses. It's a long passage that I want to cover here, but I don't want to read it all. But verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. And verse 32, and this, it sent therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. And when he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately and you have done well to come. Now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. I'm sure God will indeed bless the reading of his word. What I would like to speak to you today about is Jesus Christ, but also about centurions. And it's a theme that I've been interested in looking at what we would define as the, the Roman Empire and all that that would signify in history. And it's something that never quite goes away. And it permeates a lot of our current thinking and looking back and even for Christians for looking ahead as well about what God has to say on the subject of eschatology, which is really just the end times and how God has a plan for the future. But what we want to look at is just something of these three individuals who had an experience with God and what that meant to them and their life. And I want you to think today how God can speak in your life today what that could mean to you, what it does mean to you, and how you can respond to the call of God in your life. You may be someone who has followed the Lord Jesus Christ for many years in your life, and it may be something you have done day by day. God has a plan and a purpose for you, and he wants to encourage you. And this word here today from the scriptures will be an encouragement to keep going on in that faith but also for those who maybe have never made a specific decision in their life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to make him your saviour and Lord, and to commit your life to him and to serve him and to witness 
for him. There's a challenge from these verses and the word that we're going to say today. So that's the verses. There's also a reference in Acts 27. I'm not going to speak about him, but there's Julius, who was also a centurion. And he accompanied Paul on the, the journey to Rome. And he was uh, from the Augustan cohort. And I'm going to explain that briefly, what that means. There's a bit of background that helps when we open up the Bible and we see these terminology and these people and what relevance does that have? I think it's good to know what's in the Bible and what it teaches. And just the kind of background, it's helpful in the Old Testament, but we're in the New Testament and it's different. The Jews were, we could say, a rebellious people and they turned away from God. And right through the books of the Old Testament, we see that journey. And they're now in a situation where they're under occupation and they have to answer to what we call now the Roman Empire. And they were subject to them and that affected their lives and everything that they would want and had to do. That occupation came at a cost. The Roman Empire was very, very uh, efficient very well organized and they had an army that was second to none and some of the the kind of the structure of it from the legionnaires up you had the centurions and often it's referred to as centurion was in charge of a hundred men but recently when i was at a, an exhibition at the hadrian's wall it really referred to 80 men under them still a lot of people to report to and to look after and these centuries as it were of centurions 10 of them made up a cohort and 10 of them made up a legion and a legion was 6,000 legionnaires it's a big army but if you look into it in history very efficient very well organized and uh, they could manage to build a wall stretching from one end of the country at the uh, wall's end in the east of England right through to Cumbria on the far end and uh, that was to keep the barbarians out. And I don't know if you want to count yourself in that category, whether you stand north or south of the border. But there was a group that I did read, just as a side issue. The Venicones were people from Fife. Now, they were quite savvy because they were allies of Rome and they were able to supply the Roman army with their corn. So they must have been quite efficient and quite businesslike to take on the opportunities that came their way. But that aside, this was an army that occupied a vast part of the, the known world at that time. And why I mention that is that this man here in Matthew chapter 8 that we looked at and we read that reading there, and he was under the command of Herod and Tippus, and they were a non-Jewish uh, group from Lebanon and Syria. And that might be important to get a wee bit of background to what this man had grown up and what he was thinking and what his idea of God and who God was and what that unfolded in his life. And it's interesting when you look at the story, we often think of many people coming to this, our nation now from different parts of the world, but parts of that army, the Roman army came from Spain, Dalmatia and Rhineland. They weren't all from Italy. They were from different parts of the world at that time. The Romans had a fascination with Egyptian culture, which is interesting because we read about that in the Old Testament, particularly the book of Exodus. And they worshipped gods. And the Romans had their gods to worship as well. Jupiter, Hercules, Mars, Vulcan, among some of them. And when I was at a, a museum, Museum in Maryport, the Senhouse Museum, they had actually uncovered some carvings of these gods that had been buried in a field way back in the early parts of the second and third century. Why that's important is to get the flavour of this centurion here who's coming to Jesus has come from a background where there have been many gods, much that these people of the time focused their attention on and it was very important to them. They hung on to this belief system that these gods were important in many and every aspect of their life. But this centurion recognises Jesus Christ 
as different, recognises him as someone who is out with the system that Rome operated in. This was the Son of God. And if we look at our chapter 8 and uh, verse 5, Jesus had entered Capernaum. And Capernaum was at the north end of the Sea of Galilee. And we see there from chapter 11, verse 23, that mighty works were done by the Lord Jesus in Capernaum. They didn't respond to these works. They didn't recognise what Jesus Christ was doing. But this man did. And this centurion had a servant who was unwell and was ill, paralysed, dreadfully tormented. And he comes to Jesus and asks him if he could help. And he could heal him. Now at that time, half or a third, between a third and a half of Rome, population of one million was servants. And this man here came and cared for a servant, which is unusual at the time. Possibly this was a personal servant of the centurion. He showed compassion. And this was noted by the Lord. This was a contrast, if you think, to the earlier verses, if we had read this book in other parts of the gospel. The Jews, many were unresponsive to Jesus. And here comes somebody from maybe an unexpected field who recognises something about Jesus Christ. And maybe today you have come here and the, you recognise that Jesus Christ has something special and significant and that you would like to find out more about that and what meaning and purpose that could have in your life. Jesus says in verse 7, I will come and heal him. But the response of the centurion was, I'm not worthy that you should come under my house. And a remarkable response, he says, but only, centurion says to Jesus, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. That's quite remarkable to think that he recognised that Jesus had that authority. And he spoke about the things that he had authority as a, a centurion. He took his orders and he gave his orders and people would respond to it. You might think this centurion here telling you to do this and that might sound like your boss at work telling you what to do and what you should do. But that was part of the structure and that was part of the way things worked to be obedient and to follow instructions and often particularly in an army that is required and that is necessary and in many parts of life that would be necessary as well to be obedient and it is a, a principle that we're looking at here to be obedient not in this case to be somebody in the army but to Jesus Christ to God to be obedient to the claims that he has on your life that word of the Lord Jesus we can think of that in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 where it says, upholding all things by the word of his power. Matthew 8 and 26, by his words he rebuked the winds and the sea. There was a great calm. And we think of John 11 and 43 when he said, Lazarus, come forth. It was just a word. It was just words that he spoke. And yet, miraculous events occurred and that is someone special who has such power we call it you know the omnipotence of God the power of God and it, it's something to behold and although we don't see that maybe in our day there are many ways that we can see the power of God at work around us even the first one there about the sustainer we have an earth that was created by God and it's sustained by God. And it's his earth. And we, mankind, if we put it that way, have been given a responsibility to look after it. But we must always be looking after it in the recognition that we do so. It's God's. It's not ours. We are not in control. And we are answerable to God. But he helps and he assists and he leads and he guides. And it's like our lives as well that he does that. In verse 10, Jesus said, he marveled, and he said, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. What a commendation for that centurion. 
that his faith was commented by the Lord himself. And that's in contrast earlier in Mark 6, verse 6, when it talks about their unbelief. There's always a contrast. There's always someone who believes, but many who don't believe. And that can be an individual's response. But we should open our eyes and our eyes of faith to who we are listening to and who we are reading about in the Lord Jesus Christ and look at what he is saying and what he means or what he could mean to us. And in verse 11, there's a little bit of a foretaste of what's going to come in the if we read on to our other chapters in the Bible and books of the Bible later, when he says there, uh, many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. This refers to Gentiles, non-Jews, who will come to that understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, accept him as Saviour and Lord. This was a big step in the Gospels, but this was the Lord telling what was going to happen. Verse 12 talks about the outer darkness. That could, the Bible teaches very clearly there's a heaven and there's a hell. There's a good place, you could say, and a not so good place. And many who thought they were righteous weren't righteous. They were just self-righteous. And many who were sinners confessed their sin and turned to Jesus and received him as saviour and have that assurance of eternal life. And these are matters that are important to make a decision on. What is our destination? What will be the end point in eternity? Is it heaven or is it hell? Verse 13 talks about the faith that was needed. Let it be done, Jesus says. The faith of the centurion was rewarded, greatly rewarded, with the servant being healed. We don't really know too much about the servant who got the healing. We can only imagine what his reaction would have been when asking what is going on here. But that's the power of God. That's the wonder of God. That's the wisdom of God. And that's to the glory of God that such things are. Let's move on to chapter 27 and that verse that I read there, verse 54. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the great things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And if we had taken time to read the previous verses that can or the context of this particular verse, this is the situation on the cross when the Lord Jesus Christ is crucified. And the veil of the temple was torn in two, top to bottom. The earthquake and the rocks split open. Graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went in to the holy city and appeared to many. I found these verses personally very intriguing and very thought-provoking as to what happened here. And we're left just to wonder all the aspects. We're told enough to know something happened. But what a reaction that must have had in that time. It's well seen there was no 24 news satellite channels about in the days, but that would have been a story. You could just imagine them asking, what is going on here? What is happening? But that was the reaction of this centurion and those with them. They were witnesses to that. And they must have thought they were at this cross. Here was somebody they were crucifying. What was happening? Who was this? Why was all this happening round about? And this must have been one of the most incredible periods of our history in this world when we think of what happened on that cross and the events surrounding it. No wonder so many people, as it unfolded in the weeks ahead, where they looked and thought, that's what it means. Acts chapter 6 about, talks about a great many priests believed. It must have answered a lot of their questions. They must have been fully aware of the significance of the curtain of the earthquake and all that was going on and how wonderful it is when God moves and works in people's lives and all the questions you have what is this about who is this and all the Holy Spirit's leading in your life leads you to the answer and to that unfolding of what is 
truth. This man feared, and that suggests he had a great awareness of sin. If you fear God, that's probably the greatest thing you can ever do. And it's not a fear out of negative fear. It's a respect of fear, recognising who God is. One of the great people of Scottish history, John Knox, feared no one but God. And he spoke very clearly of that in his life. And it's a great principle to have. And I think it's quite clear that this man had a real appreciation when he said this truly is the Son of God. If we look at it in verses 40 and 43, this man's been listening to people who've been talking about the Son of God. And he's heard people saying like, John chapter 19, verse 7, it says, he made himself the son of God. And verse 43 of the chapter we read, for he said, I am the son of God. And passers by, in verse 40 says, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So this centurion and those with him have been listening to what people are saying. They've witnessed great events. And this sometimes can happen in your life. It might not be as dramatic as what an earthquake. It could be for some people in some parts of the world. But God can be in that. God can be moving and speaking. And sometimes we have to stop, listen, and think that it might be that God is speaking to us in some way. I was reading the wee Look in the Fields magazine that we get. And uh, it's much more modern now for me because I can go on my phone and I can download it and I can look at it each day. And on the, the 20th, 24th of September, 22, there was a little article in there from somebody called Mr. and Mrs. Z, and they were in Egypt. And they were talking about missing or a, a meeting they were going to, and the time had been changed, and they had to rejig their travel arrangements in Cairo. And they were on a train at 4 p.m. this day, and they were speaking to people about their faith, about the Bible. And these two people gave their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ on that journey. And after that man, that couple had finished speaking to them, a cleric, a radical cleric had come up and said, can I speak to you? I've been listening to you, and I want to know more about that. And there's an example of that centurion listening to other people speaking. And you might listen to someone else speaking about Jesus Christ and the true gospel and the faith in him. And you might want to know more. You might wait to say, what is that all about? How can I discuss that further? In that particular instance, that these people have been taking that person through courses on what it is to become a believer. And that's in a part of the world where it's very difficult and very challenging to make a, a commitment to Jesus Christ. That can be a, a life-changing commitment in many ways, even in practical ways within a, a family community situation. Finally, we'll just look at some verses in Acts chapter 10. Caesarea, if you have a Bible map and you look at it, is on the coast of the Mediterranean. Caesarea Maritima, and there's a Caesarea Philippi that we read about inland, but this is on the coast. And this is a place that was built by Herod the Great. And it's a fascinating place when you look at the archaeology of it. He built a harbour in a place where it was difficult to build a harbour. It was 40 acres in size. It could take 300 ships. He built an aqueduct which took water from eight miles away. This was a very Roman city in a very non-Rome place. And it was a centre for world trade and communication. And it was a great place for the Romans to be involved in the empire. 
and to go to Judea and to go to that place. And it was very much all the goings on of Rome built there by Herod the Great. This was to keep Herod in with the Roman authorities and to look good to them. It was also a city where in 1960 they found an inscription about Pilate, Pontius Pilate. History had said, oh, it's only in the Bible he's talked about. Well, we can't be real because it's in the Bible. But they found a stone with his name and an inscription on it. It doesn't mean an awful lot to us or to anybody, other than the fact that the Bible's accuracy has shown to be verifiable in this particular instant. A very important figure in the story of the Gospel is Pilate. But anyway, this is the place where this centurion is living. And it must have been a very hedonistic society. And yet, in amongst all this, there is a, a God-fearing man considering and thinking the merits of the God of heaven and praying. Not quite a proselyte in the Jewish, to the Jewish faith, but he's thinking and praying and working. And God speaks to him. And God listens to his prayer. And that reminds me of the fact he's called devout. But it reminds me of that verse in Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that, that which was lost. And Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me. If you're looking for God, if you're looking for peace with God, if you're searching for the answer in life and the truth of life, God is speaking to you today. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Warren Weasby says, God responds to every searching heart. If you are genuine today and wanting to know what it is to have peace with God, then listen and read and respond to that. Joppa was about 30 miles away and the two had to meet. Cornelius had sent for Peter and Peter had to learn a lesson that we'll not go into in this chapter at the moment. But Peter responded and went from Joppa to Caesarea. Joppa was a place that Jonah fled from to Tarshish. Joshua was a place for the wood for the temple the old, and the second temple was taken to and we also know that it was in the territory of Dan. So it was a well-known place. Peter went from there to Caesarea. And we read a verse there, which I think is one of the most interesting verses that I come across in the, the New Testament. Not because it's dynamic, not because of any great doctrine in it. But it's the person who is, God is moving and working in their life. And the Holy Spirit is convicting. And Cornelius says, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. I would hope and pray that that would be you today, that you're here to listen. And that all that God has to say will be something you want to respond to. The message of the gospel is telling us that we should recognize that we are a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Romans chapter 10, where Paul is speaking, talks about confessing our sins and believing in our heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And if we are prepared to repent and recognize that we are sinners before God, if we are prepared to repent and seek forgiveness, and if we believe that Jesus Christ is the one who took our place on that cross at Calvary, just like these people were witnesses, but the centurion who was there looking on Jesus, and he recognised truly this was the Son of God. We have to come to that point in our lives to recognise that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came. And he died on the cross. He rose on the third day. He's ascended to heaven. 
and he's pro coming back again for those who have trusted in him. I hope that what we've looked at in these verses from these passages in Matthew and in the book of Acts about these well-meaning and quite uh, good people, these centurions, representatives of a time in history and an army and a people who didn't believe at that time in the Son of God. But there were individuals who recognised there was something about Jesus Christ that was different. And it would be something for you today to recognise him as the one who can be your saviour and your Lord. And if you do that, and if you follow him, if you've made that decision, serve him well, talk of him, speak of him, and believe like these folk in a train in Egypt, other people might be interested. Other people might want to say, I want to know more about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we give thanks for the gospel, for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the one who came into this earth with the purpose of going to that cross at Calvary and they are dying for the sin of this world. We merited punishment, but our God, you have given mercy, you have given grace, and it is our prayer that each one here would come to that understanding in their life, and that they would put faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Saviour and Lord. We give thanks for this time together and ask you to continue with us, watch over us, and we give thanks for all things. And we pray now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.